I describe it as the past, present, and future of money through the lens of technology. Like the telegraph came out and as the speed of money moved, um, there needed to be all these middlemen to kind of like make it more efficient. And um, unfortunately, that's really centralized a lot of power into those middlemen. And they, they eventually became, you know, middlemen for the whole country, like a central bank. And what's remarkable about Bitcoin is the first technology that can make money more efficient and more decentralized. You know, maybe the right allocation for someone who spent a, thou a thousand hours on it and has high conviction is different than someone who spent five minutes on it or barely knows it. I think over time, Bitcoin will grow less volatile as it's more widely adopted and more liquid because it makes it so that one entity can't move the price as much. What's the second best? There is no second best. There's no second best crypto asset. There's a crypto asset. It's called Bitcoin, right? Right? There is no second best. It's a pleasure to have you on stage on the How to Bitcoin. Happy to be here. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, we are at Madeira at uh, Bitcoin Atlantis. And um, could you, for our French audience, just present yourself? Maybe they are not aware of who you are, what you have been building so far. Sure. And yeah. Uh, I'm Lynn Alden. I have a background in engineering and finance. Um, and uh, I run uh, lynnalden.com. So we do uh, economics analysis, investment analysis, covering multiple different assets. Uh, we focus a lot on Bitcoin and how it fits into the kind of the broader picture. Um, I'm also on the board of Swan Bitcoin, and I'm a general partner at Equidef Capital, where we do uh, Bitcoin-focused venture investing. So helping startups get capital, get the resources they need to kind of build out higher layers and applications and things that make Bitcoin e easier to use or, or that you can do more with it. Okay. And you, you've been uh, writing a book recently called uh, The Broken Money? Yes. Could you explain quickly what is the, the main purpose of this book and what is the, yeah, the main idea behind it? Sure. So Bro Broken Money is like a book that is kind of about Bitcoin, but Bitcoin's not in the title. Yeah. And it doesn't really show up until the last third. So the main point is to kind of spend two thirds focusing on the current money system, how it works, how it came to be like it is, why it has certain flaws, how bad those flaws are. And then how Bitcoin can, you know, transform some of those things and make some of those things better. So basically, I describe it as the past, present and future of money through the lens of technology. So a lot of money, um, like especially money history books, they'll focus on politics. Well, like what certain decisions were made at certain times, whereas I instead mainly focus on how technology kind of changes how, where the incentive structure works, who has power, who doesn't. It kind of ch changed over time based on technology. Okay. Okay. And I, I've been uh, going uh, through your your website, and I encountered one of your um, your quotes. It was I was say it. How how did we get there? Why isn't our money better than in this than this in the twenty first century? And um, you said that after politics can affect things tem temporarily and locally, but technology is what drives things forward permanently and globally. Yeah. From shells to gold, from papyrus bills of exchange to central banks, and from the invention of the telegraph to the creation of Bitcoin. See, this is just as true for money as it is for anything else. And I, I think it's really, um, like it blow my mind <laughs> because most of the time we think that uh, things are as they are as a Bitcoin of you or just set six people that people are trying to screw up, uh, to screw uh, people up and uh, just take advantage of us. But sometimes the technology to empower the individual and just to bring uh, liberty are just not here. <laughs> yeah. And for Bitcoin, it seems like it is the case that for everything else. Yeah, so, sometimes the existing system, there are malicious actors in it that, that do harm. But a lot of times it's not that. A lot of times it's people trying to do good and it's just a very centralized system and their choices make rippling effects. And basically because of where technology lined up, it has given them power. So back in the 1800s, a lot of transactions were physical. You change coins or banknotes with someone and it's a fairly physical, somewhat decentralized process. But over time, as, as like the telegraph came out and as the speed of money moved, um, there needed to be all these middlemen to kind of like make it more efficient. And um, unfortunately, that's really centralized a lot of power into those middlemen. And they, they eventually became, you know, middlemen for the whole country, like a central bank. 
And even like there are many countries that rely on the global reserve currency. So in the 1800s and early 1900s, it was the UK. Now it's the USA. And so it's just layers and layers of centralization. I think if you describe the history of banking technology uh, from, you know, paper to printing press to analog encryption techniques. So, you know, if you make a receipt that's redeemable for gold, how do you make it not forge? How do you make it so it can't be forged or duplicated? All of these things, basically every friction in money was solved by more centralization. And that's kind of the, been the history of banking. And what's remarkable about Bitcoin is the first technology that can make money more efficient and more decentralized. So it's like a, a trend change from the way that it's been going for centuries. And that, that's part of why I think it's so powerful. Okay. And what do you think about like the ETF and the, 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 the first layer being uh, blocked by all the transactions, the ordinal, those things and things probably just moving out of the first layer and uh, the possibility for the individual to, to take control of their account, their money. Yeah. And being uh, like replaced step by step by, by uh, another time, some yeah. other um, people getting on the way to the, the safe custody and those things. How do, how do you manage to, to framework this? Uh... So the, I guess the way I frame it is that Bitcoin obsoletes central banks. It doesn't on its own uh, obsolete all banks, right? Mm -hmm. it, it obsoletes the, the central core of the system, the ledger that all the banks tie into right now is central banks. And now it can be Bitcoin. It can be that, that's what it can be in the future. Um, now there's still layers or services that you have to build on top of it to scale it. Hmm. Some of those are custodial. For example, Cash App in the in the US and you know connects over Bitcoin and Lightning to other ones is allows people to send any other Cash App user money, and it's like a very centralized system, and it works as long as you trust Cash App and trust the the legal structures you're in. If you're in an environment where you you don't really trust the legal structures, you might want to do more trustless um, solutions. I think what's cool about Bitcoin is you can kind of like you, you build a stack and with our current system, you can't really choose where you um, operate in the stack. Like you can't operate directly with the Federal Reserve. It's not even a choice. The only banks can really connect into it. Um, and you can't, you know, if you're in a certain country, you can't really choose what currency you want to use. You're kind of stuck into that local monopoly currency. And what Bitcoin does is the base layer is it reintroduces choice. It says, you know, you can if, if you can, you know, have some degree of resources, you can use the main layer. Um, it's still fairly cheap. It's still often cheaper than an international wire transfer. Um, you know, you, you don't want to store $25 or 25 euros worth of Bitcoin on the main chain. But if you have, you know, some moderate savings, you can use the main chain. And then for smaller things or faster things and more private things you want to do, there's all these other layers that people can interact with. They can trust, for example, Liquid as a federation rather than a single point of failure. It's a federation of entities that, you know, has like cheaper transactions, more private transactions, faster transactions. That's useful. I'm pretty bullish on uh, eCash, so Chalmain eCash. Mm -hmm. uh, it allows kind of, you know, people to set up their own little local bank. Basically, it's... Like with Fedimint. Yeah, Fedimint uh, yeah. and, and Cashew. And and most of how... The, what, the kind of the philosophy behind these technologies is that people can share UTXOs. They can mm -hmm. share on-chain. And that can either be through certain trust-minimized systems or a bunch of people can come together with some degree of trust and operate more efficiently. Um, and I think, you know, over time, we'll see more and more tech that makes that more and more trustless. So, for example... One of the recent developments with BitVM, that's like, you know, programming on top of Bitcoin. One of the potential things they could do with that is bring optimistic fraud proofs to Bitcoin, which as a tangible example, if you have a federation, you can make it so you only have to trust one member of the federation, to be honest, because they would have the power that if the others try to cheat, they can force it back on chain. Hmm. And so, you know, if you trust a federation, you have to trust the majority. Um, but if you trust that you could just even just if as long as one member is honest so i think that over time it'll scale better and i think that the pain points we experience now are what kind of entices us to build more and build faster and change the way we do things because back when there were no fees people didn't really care about scaling too much but now that we have fees um it makes sense that people have to they have to build more um scaling layers and i think we're seeing that happen now okay and what, what uh, as a financial advisor as you also are What, what will you, what will you, what will be your advice for people to allocate Bitcoin in their portfolio, in their life? Uh, yeah. Because for me, it's like, um, I doing it uh, because I'm passionate in it. I yeah. feel like it's the, the best investment that I can ever find. But is it reasonable to just go 100% uh, to leverage to? 
Yeah. What's the... So I, I think the only wrong number is zero. Okay. Right. So uh, I think, I mean, there's obviously a range of people out there. Some people are 80 years old. Some people are 20 years old. They probably shouldn't have the same allocation. Some people have spent five minutes looking at what Bitcoin is. They don't really understand it. Other people spend a thousand hours researching everything about it. You know, maybe the right allocation for someone who spent a, thou a thousand hours on it and has high conviction is different than someone who spent five minutes on it or barely knows it. So I think that my general kind of recommendation is zero is the wrong number. Almost any other number is reasonable. You know, if someone wants to put 3% of their portfolio in a Bitcoin, um, you know, that, that could be meaningful if Bitcoin goes up dramatically over the next 10 years. On the other hand, if someone studies it and has more conviction, then they, they can choose to dial that up to a number that makes sense for how much work they put into it and, and how they see it going. So my allocation's, you know, fairly high, but it's also because I spend a lot of time on it. I'm willing to kind of take that risk. Whereas if I didn't look into it that much and I, and I, you know, it, I had that much allocation to it, I'd be nervous during drawdowns and things like mm -hmm. that. Whereas, but because I've studied it so much, it's more just like I'm detached from it and I'm kind of watching the fundamentals of the network play out and grow and monitoring for risks and things like that, but letting, letting it do what it's doing. Yeah. And you, you especially wrote an article on the, um, on this, on how the, the, the network is getting healthier at yeah. the time. And you, you kind of try to, to create a framework to rate the network yeah. and how, what was the, the final grade of it and what did you expect at first and did it validate what you, you were feeling? I gave it an A minus, which is pretty good. Yeah. Um, and my view was that there's a little bit more work that could be, could be done on privacy scaling, um, and, you know, mining pool decentralization. There's a couple areas that could be a little bit, um, better. But that overall, the network's functioning basically as intended. Um, a lot of people say Bitcoin has no fundamentals. So there's no way to analyze it. Whereas, like in that article, I showed all different uh, measurements. One is one is price and liquidity. That's a big one. The, you know, the bigger the network is, it, it's it generally it's that that's a sign of adoption and growth. And and um, but there's multiple other ones. There's things, for example, how many conversion points are there in the world? So, for example, if I have uh, Egyptian pounds or Norwegian currency, and I I'm in New Jersey, United States. I can't really do anything with those currency units. Mm. Uh, but if I have a gold coin, there's plenty of places where I could, I could get gold off my hands. And so when I look at Bitcoin, I think, how does it compare along that spectrum? So there's some monies like gold or dollars or in, in euros where you can bring around, around the world. And there's a number of conversion points you can do with them. And Bitcoin is kind of going up the ranks and kind of becoming one of the more saleable monies. Um, some of the others are basically security. How many security incidents have there been in, in say, a rolling multi-year period? Um, and it's also things like, you know, what is the state of mining? What is the, how is the mining supply chain? Is it, is it getting more centralized or is it getting less centralized? And so there's multiple different metrics you can look at. And I think across most of them, it's getting better. And a couple of those, it's, it's kind of the same. It's not really getting worse in almost any metric and as far as I'm concerned. Okay. And one last question. What do you think for the next cycle that's going on with the, like the halving? Like every measure seems to be more bullish than every uh, other cycles. Like the, we are almost getting all time high in USD term. In Euro, we already reached the all time high. Yeah. And I don't even speak about like other uh, fiat currencies that yeah. are just uh, completely wrecked. <laughs> so like for the next cycle, do, do you think we'll... Um, because more and more people just think like the volatility will um, diminish. But with the time, I feel like it's going to be the contrary. <laughs> like because the the rarity is getting uh, crazy. Yeah. Everything uh, like the, the, the currency is getting printing. So do, do you feel like we are getting to explore the, the multiplicator? The multiplier. Like, uh, like the multiplier. Yeah. Like, so, so far, every cycle has been smaller than the yeah. last cycle in terms of percent. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I, I think eventually we'll break that. I don't know if it'll be this cycle or not. I, I mean, I would like it to. Yeah. Um, but I think eventually we break that trend. Okay. Um, and I think over time, Bitcoin will grow less volatile as it's more widely adopted and more liquid because it makes it so that one entity can't move the price as much. You know, in the last cycle, FTX, by re re and stuff, they, they could actually affect the price. Um, whereas if, uh, the more, the bigger it is, the more widely held it is, the more liquid it is, the harder it is for any one entity to really move the price. But I still think we have to go through some more cycles to get to that lower volatility state. I think, uh, you mm -hmm. know, 
in order to have volatility the upside, which we like, it comes with volatility the downside because if it just keeps going up, eventually people leverage it and break it. Um, so I don't really have like a price target this cycle. I think it's hard to predict, but I, I can just share the measures that I'm watching. So for example, um, you know, there's, there's certain on-chain indicators that can give me a rough idea of how far we're into the cycle. So for example, the, the percentage of coins that have not moved in a full year, you know, when you see that falling rapidly, it means like, you know, people that have locked up coins and they're up 5x or 10x on their purchasing power, and they're starting to trim that either to rebalance or to, you know, buy a house or whatever they're, they're doing. And so as new demand comes in, eventually at a certain price, it does start unlocking some supply to meet that demand. Hmm. And so when you see that you're further in that cycle, that's when, you know, it makes sense to get a little bit more cautious, maybe about your expectations. Um, but we're, Right now, the signs show we're nowhere near that. We're still early in a bull market and, and very little of the older supply has wanted to move with these prices. I think it would take notably higher prices to, to get any of them to sell meaningfully. Okay. And do you feel like uh, for this cycle, we'll have uh, like states coming on and uh, say, yeah, we, we are all in. We are going to, to take our treasury and start uh, building some treasure with Bitcoin? I don't know about all in, but I think, um, you know, we've already seen El Salvador make a legal tender and mm. hold some. We've already seen the kingdom of Bhutan mining Bitcoin. Um, you know, we've seen partnerships with some miners and, uh, you know, countries in like the UAE, you know, the UAE, uh, and, and some, yeah. of the, some of the cities there. Um, so I, I think we'll see probably more nation states on some at least small level get a not, get off zero. Basically, I said the, my view, the only wrong answer is zero. And I think, uh, at the nation level, you start to see that, you know, as it, as it gets bigger, as it gets more liquid, it becomes more interesting to institutions and sovereigns. And, and, you know, the more, more cycles it, it doesn't die. They, you know, people that dismissed it five, 10 years ago start to reassess it. And so I think we're kind of at that phase yeah. where people have seen it not die enough times that it is starting to become interesting to the sovereign level. Yeah. The, the, the lean G effect. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think we, we did a quite a great turnaround. <laughs> I don't have the term. So yeah, it was a pleasure to have you on stage. Yeah. I hope we'll uh, do another one. Sure. Maybe uh, by webcam or something. Sure. And uh, yeah, pleasure to have you. Good Thank to meet you. you.